So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this Facebook Live event. This is uh, part of Save Our Schools Arizona's Speaking of Schools series. And tonight we're talking about inequity in Arizona's public schools. I'm Sharon Kirsch. I'm a co-founder and the director of research for Save Our Schools Arizona. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a statewide grassroots nonprofit dedicated to research, community engagement, voter outreach, um, all around uh, supporting public education in our state, making it a priority. So today we are discussing the critical importance of providing an equitable and accessible public education for all of Arizona's students. And we'll talk a little bit about how Arizona is falling short. So thank you all for joining us. Those of you who are on Facebook Live can put questions in the comments and we will do our best to get to those. So now I want to introduce you to our honored guests. I'm so um, grateful to both of you being here. I'll start with Representative Lorenzo Sierra. He has a long history of local and statewide community service and advocacy, most recently as a member of Arizona's House of Representatives. Lorenzo grew up in Tucson, attended public schools, and is among a new class of Latino leaders in Arizona, someone who is proud of his deep roots in our state and who works to create community where everyone is represented, respected, and has a chance to succeed. So throughout his time at the legislature, he has fought to increase investments in our public schools, create good jobs, and build thriving communities. So we are so grateful, Rep Sierra, for you joining us today. And next, I would like to introduce Verdetta Hodge, who has been a leader in her community for decades. In 2016, she made history becoming the first African-American woman elected to public office in the city of Tempe. For the last three years, she's served as president and vice president of the Tempe Union High School District Governing, Governing Board, where she has stood as a champion for the needs of students, educators, staff, and working families. Verdetta also serves on the East Valley NAACP and is co-treasurer of the Booker T. Washington Child Development Center. So she also, we are very proud to have her serving on the board of Save Our Schools Arizona Network. And uh, I just wanna thank you both so much for being here today and helping us understand uh, what the equity issues are that face our students and um, our schools in Arizona. So Verdetta, I would love to start with you. And as a lifelong community activist and someone who I know education is near and dear to your heart, Tell us a little bit about what you see as the prim primary equity issues facing students and families in Arizona today. Um, thank you. Thank you for definitely having me on this. It's um, a, always a pleasure to, um, to do forums to, to just educate people to understand. Um, one of the biggest um, unequity I see in our education today is that I'll be honest with you, it's the political fight. It's because everyone, they have, it's a political fight, meaning that they have put education as a big, um, it's like, it's almost like a trophy and they're and each side is pulling at it. And the, the education is the one suffering in the end. Meaning that um, when you make decisions like with voucher bills, because you decide that you want to go up against and say, oh, it's for the equity of our minority students, which it really doesn't help our minority students at all. Um, it becomes all about um, political. It, it becomes so political. It becomes, this is what, um, this is what it's about. I mean, it's so political now it's in the school boards, meaning that you can't even go into a school board meeting and talk about kids, um, success in education, it's more about, are you going to do about, what are you doing about critical race theory? What are you doing on this? What is that? This is what's happening in the legislature. We get so much of the national and state level fight in our school boards that we have, we're, we're so busy combating that, that it takes away from the job that we need to be doing. And that takes away from the equity of what we can be doing for our students. If you really want to help our kids, our minority kids, and our kids that are lower income, then put more money in education, the public education these kids go to every day. Yeah. I think that's the biggest um, 
what I see is the biggest issue. Yes, thank you. And do you think, do you see that that has gotten worse recently in the past yes. few years? Like what, what is your sense of that? It has gotten extremely worse, um, especially since COVID. I'll be honest with you. I, I'll say two things. It's, a, it's the political climate of who was in office at the time on top of the fact that people have more time on their hands because they're mm -hmm. home a lot. So they take on issues um, that's, that they feel that they can do at this time. And that really does, um, if you only get in half of the information and you're, you're passionate about it on one side and the political climate is telling you, yes, they're taking, you know, this is what you need to do. And there's a lot of hatred being spit out there about public education and what education is doing for kids then this is what we get. So I believe that COVID heightened the, the effect of what was going on. So yes, I think that it's been worse in the last couple of years. Yeah. And it's hard to see it, I think, because really who loses are our kids. Exactly. Right? It's they're the ones who get pushed aside while everybody's bickering and fighting. And for those of us who want to just get to the work of helping our kids be successful, it makes it hard. I have seen kids, I have seen teachers, I've seen parents and teachers, I've seen parents who have came to board meetings and praise our teachers six months before or literally ones came back and tore them down oh. six months later because they felt one way or the other about virtual or mass or something. Yeah. So I just seen, I've seen, sometimes I've seen the best of people, but most likely you see a lot of the worst and that's the sad part about it it's just that we kind of just ripped each other apart the same people who we cared so much about so yeah it's very hard to see yes it is so representative sierra could you give us the perspective um tell us a little bit about what it's like to be in the arizona legislature and what you see the legislature doing or trying to do or not doing in terms of addressing the inequities in education in Arizona? Yeah, thank you, Sharon. And thank you for that question. And thank you for having me tonight. Uh, in fact, I just got off the, uh, out of committee, out of the appropriations committee just a bit ago, and I'm on the way to my next event, but I absolutely would not miss the chance to be with the SOS team, some of my favorite people. And one of the reasons that I do what I do over here in the uh, legislature. So we had a, a briefing from the, uh, the Department of Education today, and in that they included what the executive, the governor, is looking for in his budget. And in the in equity space, the governor's proposing, uh, I believe it's like $15 million to help support schools, the public schools that have received Ds and Fs. Now, I don't need to tell the educators because you all know that you know, any sort of remediation is going to take three to five years. It's not anything that happens overnight. It's not a one-time investment. And I think they're just missing the mark because they're thinking that their solution to inequity is going this route through this, uh, what, what they're calling Project Rocket Plus or whatever it, it, it is at this mm -hmm. point. And I and I believe it hit, it doesn't it doesn't hit the mark, because educators know that so many times it's those out of school factors that are so determinant on how a student is going to be able to achieve in any given year. And we're I you know whether it, it's uh, you know looking at this uh, foolish route uh, to uh, addressing inequities or. It seems that every time there is any question in education, uh, the majority answer is ESAs, vouchers. Let's get kids into public schools. Let's give them choice. And you look at what, what's going on right now with the governor using our COVID-19 funds to essentially send those to private schools for any family that feels, well, I don't, I don't like that my school's got a mask mandate and I'm not going to go there. Uh, so they are using those public monies. They are putting those those uh, ARPA money, Recovery Act, uh, at risk because now the Treasury Department is saying, Arizona, if you're not going to use these in the way we intended, we're going to take those back. So we've got this situation where, okay, 
uh, if you ask a Republican, what's the education answer? The education answer is an ESA. Uh, every, every answer they have is ultimately going to end up at ESA. And that's just not beneficial for, for our kids in the long run. And hopefully, uh, you know, I think we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the opportunity wait here in just a minute. And I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the bills that uh, both Senator Marsh and I have dropped uh, this past week. Okay. Well, I'll follow up with that because, of course, um, you and I hope most of our viewers know that Save, Save Our Schools Arizona came into being to stop universal voucher expansion. And that along with thousands of volunteers across the state, we put Prop 305 on the ballot in 2018. And people across Arizona by a two to one margin said, no, we do not want vouchers expanded. So in a day when you know so many people don't agree on much of anything, people, the people in Arizona agree that they do not want vouchers expanded. And again and again and again, we see bills, we see now this attempt, like you mentioned, to use federal funds to push vouchers, it's really um, disconcerting and, and makes me very, very sad that our state refuses to prioritize, or our state <clears throat> leaders refuse to prioritize public education and spend all this time coming up with these different voucher schemes. So, Bredetta, anything you want to add about vouchers? Okay. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Yes, sorry about that. Yes, as I was, I was thinking about it, as you speak, they talk about, well, we bring these vouchers for kids to have a choice and we want our minority children to have a choice. To come to find out that majority of times that minority children or lower income kids, they can't even use the vouchers because mm -hmm. yeah, they use it for, do you give a partial for, tr for, uh, for tuition? They can't trans, there, there's no transportation. So guess what? Those kids can't afford, they can't go there. So what they do is they, 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 they it's like an apple. They, they dang a little stick and they put an apple on it and they say, hey, this is for our minority kids, but let me yank it back because they don't have transportation. Let me yank it back because you need this much full tuition on it. Let me yank it back because, oh, if you miss, if you fail one, a couple classes, you're back, you're out of our school. So what happens? Those same kids that they felt that they were going to this other school, they end back up in the public education without the money behind it, because after a certain amount of time, we can't get um, money for our kids after a certain amount of days if they're not in school at that time. So we we always, as public schools, will always take them back in, but we're working on smaller and smaller and smaller budgets every time because this is what happens. They start off in these private schools or they start off and then by by halfway through the first semester, they're already back in our schools. Yeah. And that that's, that's affecting our students. And it's just sad that they want to use our minority and our lower income students as as goats to try to push red legislation through that is not it's not really for the kids that they're claiming it's for. And the worst part about it is I would love to ask them my Republican counterparts on there is how many of your kids ever went to public schools? Are you pushing it because your kids are on private school? Because I can tell you Doug Ducey's kid went to Brophy Prep. You know, he didn't go to a public school. So you think about that. Who are you actually, who is this bill actually benefiting? Is it benefiting the kids like my children who I was a single mom, black mom in America, in Arizona? No, my kids were never asked to be in a pub, in a private school. So um, I just asked that question. I'm just so frustrated with how they're just trying to destroy public schools. And that's where our, the base of our kids are medium to lower income to minorities to all the kids are at every day. Yes. So it just, it just, it just frustrates me. Yes. 95% of families in Arizona choose public schools. We and know that and support public schools. And the Arizona Republic um, did an investigative piece a couple of years ago that showed that the vast majority of people actually using ESA vouchers, regardless of what they claim, the claims they make about them being for low income or minority kids, the people who actually use them are from um, predominantly A and B rated schools in more affluent communities in our state. Well, in our urban areas, in our suburban areas. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I think you are exactly right. And again, it gets back to the issue, I think, of 
a failure on the part of our state leadership in terms of not prioritizing public education, even though that's what we care about in Arizona. And poll after poll after poll shows that people want our schools to be well-funded and want that school down the street in our neighborhood to be that fabulous resource that it always is, doors always open for all students. Yes. So if, I share. If, if, if I could really quickly here, sure. I, I just have, I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, just go back a few years and because I really remember those days when the 305 campaign was going on. Uh, my seatmate Diego Espinosa and I, he obviously owns Fuego Restaurant, which became the headquarters for 305 on the west side. And I remember the passion that the volunteers brought there as we went out and got signatures, as we went out and canvassed, and just how hard everyone worked. And it was inspiring to see that. But then you look at the shamelessness in which the, the majority comes at ESAs with. If you remember that this past legislative session the year last year, uh, ESAs came up again, but they didn't go through education. Mm -hmm. They went through the Ways and Means Committee, which yeah. is the taxing committee, which, which was the committee I sat on at the time. And they framed ESAs as the civil rights issue of our time. And they invoked all of this, this civil rights imagery. They even got a black preacher to come in and talk about the, the, mm -hmm. the importance of needing to give our minority children these, these ESAs. Well, I, I, I took that to heart because when, when they started using those civil rights terms, I said on my, my vote explanation, I said, you know, John Lewis didn't march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge to just give a few people voting rights. It was for everyone to have voting rights. Rosa Parks didn't go to the front of the bus just to give a few people the ability to ride the bus in dignity. It was so that all people could ride the bus in, exactly. in dignity. And I, and, and, you know, I, I think about the, you know, the, the black national anthem, we lift all voices and sing. And so when they co-opted civil rights into this, this voucher debate, that really hit me raw and it hit me hard. And I'll, I'll, you know, as long as we can keep having that passion that we had in that 305 election, we'll always be able to beat it back. Exactly. But we've got to maintain that passion and that diligence and keep an eye on it because anytime you turn around, there's going to be a new ESA scheme brewing up at the legislature. Yep. We know there's one cooking right now. We're just waiting for it. So, and we have now Save Our Schools, you know, we've grown so much over the last few years. We now have community action teams. We call them our CATS teams uh, all over the state. And so there are people within their own communities uh, bringing people together in those communities to talk about the importance of public education. And so I think that passion is still there. And people are really, um, really understand the crisis facing our state and the absolute priority uh, of putting public education first and, and stopping all these voucher schemes that drain so much of our public funds away from our public schools. So I would like to ask now, I think Rep Sierra, you mentioned this. So Arizona is one of nine states that doesn't have any kind of poverty weight or opportunity weight, doesn't provide any funding, the state doesn't provide any additional funding for low income kids. Why, why is that? Can you explain that to us? I, I Now I wish I could explain it. <laughs> so I can't explain it, but we're attacking the issue regardless. You may remember that, that earlier this year, my, my wife Rhonda Cagle, did a series uh, of, of what poverty looks like in our K-12. She started off with you know, a broad stroke, then went to the littles, middle school, high school, and then sort of wrapped it all up. And in doing that, she, she got with the SOS community to get teachers to tell those real stories. Yeah. What does it mean to have those kids in poverty and how hard it is for them to just keep up. And instead of looking at it holistically, the governor's response right now is, well, we're just gonna throw some money at uh, DNF schools. And that's only a part of the, the entirety of 
what the issue is here. So along with, with Senator uh, Marsh, we dropped a couple of bills last week that call for Arizona to become one of the, the, the other 41 states that has a poverty weight, which it's a weighting system that gets the resources to the students that need them where they need them. It's, it's where they're at. And, you know, I, I wish I could tell you why it is, but I know that we'll continue fighting to, to make the point that we need this here just as much as those other 41 states are. And that our, our, the kids here in poverty are no less bright than their more affluent peers. They just need the, the playing field leveled a little bit more. So we'll continue fighting and I hope the SOS community can help us uh, uh, you know, lift these bills up so that we can hopefully get a hearing. A hearing is gonna be difficult to get, but hopefully we can use that passion that we have to get this, the stories out. And I think the more stories we tell, because teachers have gone above and beyond. You look at the, 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 the pandemic really exasperated what was already a bad issue. It, it, it was already an issue in our K-12 system. The pandemic made it infinitely worse. And, and, I, and I don't think teachers have been given the credit for just the effort that they have put forth in this pandemic and everything that they have done, which is nothing short of miraculous, day in, day out, adapting to every scenario that they've had to adapt to and doing it with grace and passion. And hopefully we can get those stories out and that we can get, hopefully get, a poverty weight into our K-12 system sooner rather than later. It's going to be a fight, but it's a fight worth having. Absolutely. And I think I think it's important to, to talk about the difference between equality and equity, mm -hmm. right? So equality is just giving all kids the same amount. Equity is really meeting those kids where they are. And so that's why it's so important to recognize kids are different. They come from different circumstances. They're dealing with different stuff in their homes and in their communities. And, you know, so we, one of the reasons we need um, an opportunity weight or a poverty, poverty weight is to be more equitable. And Arizona, you know, this is of course an issue across the United States, but in Arizona, we are some of the most inequitably funded um, of any state in the US. And that's on top of the fact that we are already bottom of the barrel for per pupil spending, right? Um, highest student to counselor ratio, right? So the, the recommendation is one counselor for every 200, 250 students. In Arizona, it's almost one counselor for every 900 students. And so for those of us who teach and spend our days with students, we know the kinds of issues and traumas they bring into the classroom. It's not like they walk in the classroom and all that stuff goes away. And so we need counselors, teachers need that support. And I, I think you are so right that the pandemic has been so hard. And I think this year in particular has been hard. I think we all kind of thought, oh, thank goodness, you know, the pandemic's over and it hasn't been at all. And so people started the year really exhausted. And um, now with all of the fights over masks and everybody bickering, I, it's so, so hard for our teachers. And I do think we owe them an incredible amount of gratitude for all that they do for our kids every single day. Amen. I agree. Um, I just want to add on to what the, the conversation. I think um, you asked that question, why do you think Arizona is like that? I honestly believe it's because of the people who are in power down there at the state house don't have kids. They don't have kids that are in the situations that they would need weighted for. So they're make they're basing some of their I, I and I hate to say some of the Republicans. They they have kids. They're in private schools and and five A school. I mean, you know, getting five, you getting A plus um, ratings, and they mm -hmm. don't see the other side of it. So they 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 make they base their they base their their decisions on the, their community, their neighbors, their families. And they're not seeing the fact that there is a whole nother side to it. And that's why it's so important 
that we need diversity down there at the state level. That's why I thank you so much, Representative, for being there because we need that diversity down there. We need people who understand the communities that they're supporting. Of course, that's what I mean by that. They have the, the trust me, the predominant community is very much dealt with, is well taken care of down there at the state house. It's the people who don't. I have Guadalupe in my district. Um, and I'll tell you right now, some of the stories I've heard will break my heart, but also at the same time, it gives me inspiration because they don't stop fighting. Even though we have given up on them, they haven't given up on us and they haven't given up on themselves. And that's what we need to see. We need to help, we're not. And we're gonna keep continue to fight. I'm gonna fight with Save Our Schools. I'm gonna fight, I'm on ASBA. I'm on the executive, I'm gonna oh, fight God. in every part of my body that I'm gonna continue to fight because we have to be the change that we want in this world. And I, that's why I say, I think the reason why it's like that is because of the people who are in leadership, who has the most, the, 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 high, the vote, they don't see the world that we see. They don't even, and, and actually, I don't even know if they want to see the world that we see. So I think that's part of the reason right there. Yeah, thank you for that. So just to go back to teachers for a minute, because this is an issue that's really near and dear to my heart. I've been a teacher. I teach at Arizona State University. I've been teaching for almost 30 years. I have kids who've gone through and one who's still in public schools in Arizona. And we know that Arizona, on top of our funding issues, we also have the highest teacher turnover rate mm -hmm. in the nation. And I think the, the statistics are so staggering, it's hard to kind of wrap your head around it. But we have about 22% of teachers who quit in their first year, mm -hmm. and this is pre-pandemic, and 42% of new teachers quit by their third year. Yeah. And so these percentages are even worse in our Title I schools, in our rural schools, and so the Arizona School Personnel Administration Association found that a staggering 81% of teacher positions in Arizona remain vacant or not filled by a certified experienced teacher, 81%. Now I say that knowing that any study you look at that says what's the most important thing we can give to our kids in school. For 50, 60 years, study after study after study has said it's a good teacher. It's a well-trained teacher. It's a passionate teacher. It makes the difference not only for the grade and the kids, the teachers teaching in that grade, but for the whole lifetime of the kid. So academic success, personal success, it's just, you know, it's not, this is just fact. And so the, the fact that we allow, you know, our state to have 81% of teacher positions either empty or filled with someone who isn't certified is just bonkers to me. And so what does the governor do? Just signs into law yet another thing to relax uh, rules around substitutes. Can you tell us about that a little bit, Rep. Sierra? Do you know about that? I believe that's an executive order that just passed here like very, very recently and I haven't had time to really absorb it, but apparently it's, it's almost if you're breathing, you can be a substitute teacher in Arizona. Yes. But getting back to, to sort of what you were saying, it's, it's going to be like this until the state gives respect to the pro profession and the professionals uh, that, that do this and, and to respect the craft at which they do that, the expertise and compensate that expertise and that craft. You know, I can tell you uh, very briefly, I, I, I have to tell you, you know, when you were talking so passionately about that, let me tell you about one teacher in my life. You know, I, I grew up in the 70s. You probably thought I grew up in the 1870s, but it was the 1970s. And uh, in third grade, I had a teacher, Miss Kaplan, who one day, uh, sent you know sent me and a couple other kids in the back of her Dotson B210 and uh if you're probably too young to remember that google it it's a little car from the 70s and she took me to the U of A University of Arizona 
up until that point, I thought the U of A was just the football team and the basketball team. I had no understanding what university was, but she took me there. She, she showed me the classrooms. We got to see a play uh, that her boyfriend was in. And, and I got to understand what this was. And at that point knew that one way or another, I was going to go to university. And it was that one teacher at that one moment that set forth in my life where I am today. And I, you know, I always wish I could run into her sometime because ultimately I ended up at Arizona State University to become the first person in my ended family to get to and through university. Every child should have a Miss Kaplan in their lives that's going to set them on that path towards success. And thank you to every teacher out there because I know they're, you're watching and you're thinking, does it really matter? Yes, it does. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for you, what you do for your students above and beyond what, what the job description is. So thank you all for, for what you do. I, um, I couldn't say it better. That's, it's, it's yeah. true. It's beautiful. Um, I'll tell you what makes it, what, what kind of breaks my heart and why I think teachers leave in the first year and the first three years sitting on the governing board is the fact that, especially when you say title one class at schools, you think, well, these teachers are raised to a metric. And that metrics, if their kids aren't hitting that metrics, then they're considered not a great teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, and when you are set by just the metrics, you don't see, they don't, they're not, they're not putting in fact of what the teacher does in the classroom. The state has it that this is the metric. If their kids are not meeting at this level, then that's not considered a great teacher. And that's what's instilled and pushed on them the whole entire time is you have to have your whole class at this level. If they're not here, then you're not doing your job. And we need, you know, we need to figure out why you're not doing your job to make sure these kids are here. Not realizing that a lot of it is, for some reason, we don't have enough funding for our kids. We, some of our kids go to bed and sometimes the only meal they get a day is the meal they get at school. So, so it's just so much that factors into it. But I think that's one of the main reasons why I talk to a lot of teachers that they feel the pressure that they're not doing enough for their students and that's what makes them leave. They will leave because they feel like I'm not making a difference because this is what, this is what they have in, instilled in them that this, you have to have this metrics. If your class is not here, then you are not doing your job. And that's not true. So um, we put sometimes expectations that some teachers will never be able to meet yeah. and that's and they feel like okay I'm a failure at this I don't you know I can't do this I, I I'm not going to do this I'm not making a difference and that's a word I hear a lot is I'm not making a difference oh. and they don't realize that they are because the ones that they make a difference with most of the time they will never know they will never hear it but they make a difference yeah the, the, I always say the noisiest people are the ones who always have the most criticism. So usually when you, when you hear it, you only hear the criticisms, but you never hear the time that you breached a child in the back room because I have teachers that have stacks of food in their classroom that they give out because they know some of their kids are hungry. I have teachers who have granola bars and breakfast bars and stuff because they know their kids come to school without breakfast. So those are the stories that they, they don't make it on that, that evaluation. Right. The only thing is evaluated by the state is where their kids are at in, in math, in English, right? In reading, those are the things, the only thing that matters. They don't realize so much more is appreciative. So as much as I possibly can as a governing board member, I thank my teachers all the time because yeah. I always say, and, I, and people say, you shouldn't say that, but I said, it's a war in education and the teachers are on the front line. Yeah. And that's what I, how I always put it. Um, so I always thank them for being on the front line because there is great teachers out there, but if we don't pay our teachers, we don't get the best teachers. And sometimes there's the opposite end, just like your story, you had a great story. I have a story that 
you teach the same way that kids remember the good, they also remember the bad. I had a teacher who just, um, she, she was there forever and she stopped caring. She told, I, I wrote a story and I was in third grade and you wanted to, you wrote what you wanted to do with your life. And I said, I want to be president. Well, um, she wrote to, she, she, she called me up to her desk and said, I'm sorry, Verdetta, but you need to have real, real, realistic um, goals in life. You will never be president. Of, you will never be president. I'm sorry, but I want to tell this teacher, and I won't say her name, that I have sat as president of Tempe Union for two years because I became president. Thank you for telling me that I will not be president, and I made it. So I'm just saying at that note, we do need to make sure we retain good teachers. We lose our best teachers because yes. they feel like they can't do it because we're not giving them the support and the moral behind it. And we hold on to people who we don't need when we see the inequities in students and because they, the, the laws hold on to you because you've been there 30, 25, 30 years. And we let a teacher who's only been there two years go because that teacher who's been there 30 years got the got the seniority over it, it's not fair because you know what? Sometimes that teacher who's only been there two years may have helped more people in two years than the person who's been there 30. So that's another thing that bothers me and concerns me. I, I, I honestly say there is, I believe in education, there is 98% great teachers out there, but that 2%, sometimes our kids fall on that. And that's usually the ones who really don't need it. So I just want to put that out there that we need to retain great teachers and we need to yes. figure out how to do that. And that's, that's been a problem um, right now. We have, we're, we're such in a crisis for teachers. We have our principals and our superintendents are substituting in classes now. So um, it, is, it, is, it is hard right now to get, and this is not something that you're right. Um, this is not something that COVID did. This right. is something that was out there long before. Yes. COVID just enhanced it. It just opened it up so people can see it more. Well, and, you know, it's not rocket science mm -hmm. to solve this problem, right? What we need is to invest right. in our teachers and teacher salaries. If we're serious about attracting great teachers, we have to pay them a living wage, right? We have to make sure their working conditions are supportive of what they're doing in the classrooms every day. Lower class sizes, more aids. Um, so I think, again, it's just a matter of priorities and the state needs to make public education a priority and putting a great teacher at the front of every classroom, a priority that would have an enormous impact on the future of our entire state, our economy, our kids, our communities. So that's, that's what we need. I, I, that, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Sharon, I, I just want to bring up a, a really quick point, uh, uh, building off what you just said. Uh, so I grew up in the Sunnyside School District down in the southern part of Tucson, and I went to Elvira Elementary School, which was 95% free and reduced when I was there, and it's 95% free and reduced there, mostly Hispanic and Black kids. And they have been in A school the past couple of years, beating all the odds. And part of that is because they've got a great pre, uh, great principal mm -hmm. and they've got a teaching staff that has remained largely intact over the last five years. So they're, they're, when you look at the, you know, uh, a teacher ex exiting the, the profession, they've kept their teachers, they've kept their really good principal. Yeah. I think you just invested in that. Yes. Wow, just think how much better we could do with just that simple formula. Yes, I agree. I agree. Give them some help. Give them counselors. Give them social workers. Um, teachers now have to be counselors, social workers, teachers, um, everything in one, and they, they don't get paid enough. We will pay a basketball player millions of dollars to go throw a ball through a hoop no one complains. But the minute that a teacher says, I am not making um, enough to afford a, an apartment near my school, we will have a collapse of a fit. So, because, oh my God, they're just begging again. They don't, you know, but yet we will, it, we don't see anything wrong with paying 
millions of dollars for sporting events or millions of dollars for this or that, this entertainment. We go out and we watch movies and we'll let the movie stars make millions of dollars just to say a few words on screen. Teachers talk on screen through the night 2021. 20, How come they didn't get millions of dollars for that? Because that's exactly what they did throughout the time of the pandemic. But we don't see it that way. We don't see the common person the, the role, the impact of the local level of what we do. We look so high and so we would, I would rather spend, um, I would rather go and spend $12 to watch a person talk about a life that I'm never gonna have on movies, but I would refuse to go out and help a teacher or a fireman, you know, get a pay raise. So I don't, I don't know, I just don't understand it, but yep. we gotta continue to fight. Yes, yes we do. Well, and so uh, to that end, I think my next question for you both is what, what can you recommend to us? So Save Our Schools does have thousands of volunteers across the state, people who are so passionate about this. What can you recommend to us to do to help you in your fight or just from your perspective, what we can do to help the state prioritize public education? Okay, mine is gonna be very easy and then I will, um, then I'll let it go to him. Just keep getting the word out. I mean, all the time. We need volunteers on the grounds telling people exactly what's happening. When there's a bad bill that we need to help our representative with, we need to make sure that we have people out there that understand this is gonna affect your child in this way. We need, I think the best thing to do is to communicate and educate our community to make sure they understand what's happening. Yeah. You know what, I, I would say, you have built an amazing amount of passion. Uh, you have built a great team. You have purpose. You have pride. A, don't quit. Mm -hmm. B, vote. Exactly. And and get everyone you know that cares about education. Get them to vote. Contact your legislators and just keep showing up. You know, it, I, I will say. Uh, today, a uh, bunch of purple shirts rolled into my meeting and I go, oh Lord, here we go. But, but it was the AEA retirees. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I get it. <laughs> good. But I will tell you, nothing fills my heart more than when I look up into that gallery and there's a bunch of people wearing red shirts. Mm -hmm. And and they're doing this because they know if they say anything, they're going to get kicked on out. You can't clap, that's for sure. <laughs> clap. But there were times when we were on our marathon budgets and it was into the morning. And I didn't think, you know, I just wanted to get into a pile, cry and leave. And I would look out and I would see those red shirts they were still there, they were engaged, they cared, and that got me through. And that probably, it, it's probably not any different for just about everyone else that's a colleague of mine is just that inspiration that you gave us. And thank you so much for that. Never think that we're not watching or that we're not caring because we absolutely do. And it does, does make a difference. Well, thank you so much for that. It's good to hear that. And we will continue to be there and continue talking to people all over the state to help them uh, kind of connect the dots between what's going on in their own communities, what they want and what they want is a great public school right down the street from them mm -hmm. and uh, how to make sure they get that and make sure that their elected officials know what's important to them. So I really wanna thank you both so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Appreciate all that you do in your communities and um, hope to talk to you again soon. So we will stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.